Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I guess we didn't start that that much later. I, uh, uh, I was, I was in the middle, middle of uh, feeding my dog. That's all. Uh, uh, okay, so um, uh, just a, a few things about the test before uh, I start. Uh, we'll do a few problems today uh, practicing. Uh, what's on it? Uh, well, what's on it is the uh, last two topics uh, since the last test, and that is uh, conservation of momentum and uh, rotational motion, okay? And uh, we've actually reviewed both for the assignment, but today I'm going to do some, uh, uh, a couple of problems from uh, conservation of momentum and uh, a problem for uh, uh, rotational, a couple of problems for rotational motion, okay? And um, the test uh, is... Uh, uh, 32 questions long, so it's a little bit longer than your last one. I think your last one was 26, but don't quote me, or 28 questions, I don't remember. But I, I timed it, and you know, it, it, it should take you roughly an hour to do it, but you, you get the two hours to do it, uh, just like, you know, the last time. So there's no, no, uh, uh, you know, no changes in the format or anything else like that. Okay, so, uh, well, let's begin. Um, so my first uh, question here is a uh, uh, conservation of momentum problem. And uh, it's uh, uh, two-dimensional, but it's kind of an easy 2D problem. And I mostly did it to uh, um, help your intuition into how momentum works. And uh, uh, I also have a variation on it, which makes it a little bit more difficult. Okay, so basically we have a, a 20 kilogram bomb uh, originally at rest. We could put the put it at the origin, originally at rest at the origin. And, you know, when it explodes, it breaks up into three pieces. Uh, one piece is a uh, five kilogram piece which travels along the plus x axis at 15 meters per second uh it's not that fast so not much of an explosion so second piece is uh seven kilograms and it travels along the negative uh y axis at uh 25 meters per second okay and note the sign there it's actually along the negative y direction not the positive y direction i'll show you a picture in a minute but um, let's just uh go through the questions quickly and there's a third piece obviously okay and so uh, the first question is what's the size of the remaining piece I guess it should have probably been more specific here what is the uh, what what mass is the, the remaining piece or what is the mass is the mass of what is the mass of the remaining piece yeah that's a little bit better so I just wanted to get the uh, the wording right so you know how much mass does that remaining piece uh, have uh, what's the x component of its velocity what's the y component of its velocity okay and then we have it in Cartesian convert that to uh, polar so what's the magnitude of the velocity what's the direction of the velocity okay and then how much energy is released uh, in the explosion okay uh, let's take a quick look at uh, a picture of uh, what that explosion is like oh and hold on we will fix this very quickly. There we go. Okay. Um, this program has been uh, crashing today, so I'm not going to be able to draw uh, right now on this picture, but I will later. Okay. Uh, but basically, uh, uh, what we have is a five kilogram piece. So here you can see the five kilogram piece. Well, I guess we should start with the red dot there. That red dot is this uh, 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 20 kilogram mass at the beginning. Okay. Uh, initially at rest at the origin and it blows up into three pieces. One piece is this five kilogram piece, which travels purely along the X direction. Okay. And then there's another piece, a seven kilogram piece, which travels along the negative Y axis. Okay. Notice the positive Y axis is up here. So it's actually going in the negative Y direction. And then I ask you, about this third piece, and the third piece is this blue arrow here, which is traveling off, and I show it in quadrant two, okay? So I said this problem was all about, you know, building up your intuition. So let's see if we can build up your uh, intuition here. Um, you know, how do I know that the third piece is going to be going off into quadrant two? I mean, if you just look at this, you go, you know, this thing explodes, and a piece goes that way, and then another piece goes that way. It kind of feels like you have to have a third piece going off in quadrant two to balance things. And you'd be right. I mean, that that's your intuition is, is helping you out here, because we have a pretty good intuition into uh, you, know, uh, you know how uh, conservation of momentum works but let me just describe it a little bit more rigorously uh, you know if there's uh, no, notice that the seven kilogram is purely along y so it doesn't contribute uh, to uh, uh, any momentum along the x and y direction uh, if you hear, if you hear my dog that's because uh, the, the mailman just delivered something but um uh, so, so the, uh, the 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 seven kilogram doesn't contribute to the x. Only the five does, and the five kilogram has a momentum in the positive uh, x direction. And since the initial momentum is zero because the thing isn't going anywhere, 
that ha that positive momentum along the plus x direction has to be compensated with a negative momentum in the other direction. Okay, so you know that the velocity of the uh, third piece has to be its x component has to be along negative x, and similarly. The seven kilogram is going off in negative y direction. The five kilogram doesn't contribute to y at all because it's going purely in x. Okay, so there's no y component to the five kilogram. It's only the seven kilogram. The seven kilogram piece is going in the negative x direction. And so to compensate, there has to be a positive uh, y component to the momentum after and to comp from the third piece. And that's gonna compensate the the seven kilogram, those two will cancel to give you zero, okay? And so if your final velocity has negative x and positive y components, then it's gonna be in quadrant two, okay? That's a little bit more rigorous way of describing what your intuition was telling you earlier, that it has to be in uh, quadrant two, okay? So it's good to do this because you, if you anticipate where the answer is gonna be, you know, you're, you're less likely to make mistakes. And you know that like on, um, uh, on the test, you know, when you have the multiple choice, I'll give you the number, but I'm also gonna say in the positive direction or in the negative direction or to the right or to the left or up or down or one way or another I'm going to get direction in there so you better you know make sure that you get the direction right and if you if you you know make an, uh, a mistake with a sign you know which is a pretty easy mistake to make and your intuition goes no wait a sec it should be in the other direction then you can check back and you know not get that question wrong okay so uh let, let's jump into this okay so the first question is what's the size of the remaining piece that's pretty easy let me just answer it right here uh this is not conservation of momentum it's actually just conservation of mass okay so if you got three pieces and you add up their masses together better ma add up to 20 so you have like m3 so I call that third piece m3 and then you have the five kilogram which is the first one seven kilogram which is the second one add them all together you better get 20 well it's pretty obvious that it's eight kilograms okay so i, I mean nothing very deep there i just kind of wanted to say uh yeah there's more than just conservation of energy and conservation of momentum there's conservation of mass and lots of other conservation laws in physics probably most of which you don't really need in your career anyhow okay so there's uh the first question the second one is what's the x component of velocity of the remaining piece or of that third piece okay so uh the momentum before because i say you know the 20 kilogram bomb starts at rest the momentum before either it's x or it's y component are going to be zero okay because if it's not moving it's got no momentum so remember what momentum is or how it's defined uh, in in more primitive terms it's m times v mass times the velocity oh, well yeah, it does have a mass that 20 kil kilogram lump has a mass of 20 kilograms but it's not going anywhere it's sitting at rest so it's got no velocity if it has no velocity it's got no momentum if it's got no momentum it's got no x component of the momentum and it's got no y component of the momentum okay so the, it starts off with no initial uh, x um, component to momentum okay after the momentum that little prime there that little tick means uh, you know after the explosion the momentum is going to have three contributions from the first mass from the second mass and the third mass okay and so it's going to be from the first the contribution from the first mass is going to be m1 times v1 but we're only interested in the x component so it's m1 v1 x and then the second one is going to be m2 v2 x and the third one's going to be m3 v3 but just the x component okay so this whole thing is only about the x component and of course, after the explosion, okay? Well, momentum is conserved, right? So whatever the X component is before, it's the same one after, okay? So that is equal to zero, okay? M1 is five, okay? That's the, the five kilogram mass there, M1. And it's traveling purely in the X direction. So its velocity is 15 meters per second in the X direction, okay? M2 is seven. It has a velocity, 25 meters per second, but it's purely along y, so there's no x component to the velocity for m2, and that's why I have a zero there, okay? So we could go back quickly to the diagram there. You could see that the seven kilogram is going purely along y. If you were to like say, well, what's the projection along the x-axis? Well, there is none, okay? Uh, you know, like here, I've got actually the x projection for v3. If v3 is on this angle here, you know, the, the y projection is you just draw these dotted lines to the y-axis. And you can see as this dot moves up along the, the vector there, then v3 is going to move along y. Okay, and, it's, and uh, same thing with x. You just draw perpendicular to the x, and that gives you the x component. And so, you know, if something is at an angle 
to the either the x or the y direction, then it's going to have both components. But the the seven kilogram is going purely along y, and so it has no x uh, component at all. Okay, that's why this is zero. All right, I think it's pretty obvious, but it's good to explain it. Okay, and then the rest of this. Oh, oh sorry, uh, the uh, m three is eight. And then V3x, that's what we don't know. That's what we're trying to solve because I'm asking for the x component of the velocity. Okay? And so that's x component of the velocity of the third piece. Okay? So, uh, you know, it's just a matter of solving this. Uh, that uh, 5, 5 times 15 plus 0, 75 plus 8 times V3x. And that works out to V3x is negative. 9.375 meters per second okay and I said notice that v3x is along the negative x direction and that's what we expected okay if we go back here you could see that v3x the x component here is traveling in the negative x direction and we expected that because it had to uh, balance against the positive um, uh, contribution the, the plus x contribution uh, from the five kilogram mass to the momentum. So the momentum to the left here and the momentum to the right uh, will cancel. Okay, all right, to give you zero. All right, so that's what's going on there. So we got the negative number as we expected. Let's do the same thing for the y component of the velocity, okay? So uh, the y component before is zero. The y component after is gonna have to be zero too, but there are three contributions now. There's a contribution from M1, there's a contribution from M2, and M3. And for each one of them, it's like MV, 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 okay? So you just do MV and then add them all up, all right? But it's just the Y component, okay? So it's M1, V1, Y component. Well, this time, the five kilogram mass has no Y component, okay? And why is that? Well, if you look at the diagram, the five kilogram mass is moving purely along the X direction, so it has no Y projection at all. Okay, so no y component. And, uh, okay, that's why that's zero. The seven kilogram mass, this time it does have a y component and it's purely in the negative direction. Okay, so it's negative 25 meters per second. All right, so just be careful up here. I said, you know, it's moving at 25 meters per second along the negative y axis. Okay, and that means that its y component is negative 25. All right, and look at the diagram again. It's, it's going downwards like that, not upwards. Okay. So, and that makes a big difference, all right? So uh, that's why this is negative 25. And then, you know, M3 is still eight, okay? And he, now we're solving for V3, Y components, so V3, Y, okay? And, you know, just simplifying that and then, uh, uh, and, you know, simplifying that, bringing it to the other side, dividing by eight, you get that V3, Y is 21.875 meters per second. So V3Y is along the positive Y direction, and that's what we expected. So if we go back to the diagram here, uh, we expected the Y component of V3 to be upwards in the plus Y direction to compensate for the uh, negative Y direction for the seven kilogram mass, okay? Remember the momentum has to balance, it has to equal zero, all right? Because that's what it was initially. All right, so great, we got those two components, okay? And uh, they're in the directions that we expected. Now, the next one is, uh, uh, you know, it's not really um, conservation of momentum anymore. We made use of that. Now I just want to switch from Cartesian to uh, polar, okay? So uh, what is the magnitude of the velocity, okay, of the third piece? And uh, to get that, uh, it's just V3. It's not the X component, not V3X and not V3Y. You want just the magnitude. In other words, how fast is this thing going irrespective of the direction? And you get that using Pythagorean theorem. Okay, so you have an X component and you just take the X component squared. You take the Y component squared. You add them together and you take the square root. And that's what I did right here. And that gives you that the velocity is uh, 23.8 meters per second. Okay, so that's the velocity irrespective of the uh, direction. So back to the diagram so that you don't confuse the components, uh, you know, how fast is it moving along that blue line? That would be that 23 point, uh, what would I say, 23.8 meters per second. Okay, how fast is it moving along that uh, the blue line there? The components are, you know, if you know, if you have a, if you're at some point along the, the blue vector there and you just project over to the y-axis, then the, the, the speed of that shadow that projection along the y-axis, that's V3Y. And you do the same thing, you project along the x-axis, you know, V3X, that would be 
the velocity along the uh, uh, of the shadow of the projection along the x-axis okay and uh, well there it is okay so there's the the the, the velocity by the way a, a simple check here that number has to be bigger than either of these two numbers okay so uh, 23.8 is bigger than the 21.8 and it's obviously bigger than the 9.37 and the, the the sign doesn't matter because you're squaring things okay so this thing will be bigger than the absolute value of either of those two numbers okay so there we go there's the magnitude and what's the other thing in uh, polar the direction whoops direction there we go okay what is the direction of the velocity? And, and, and I want the angle measured counterclockwise from the plus x axis. Okay, so the way you do that, the way you get that angle is it's the inverse tangent of the y component divided by the x component. Okay, uh, but you also have to add 180 degrees. Why? Because we are at 180 degrees because we are in quadrant three. I'm oh, sorry, quadrant two, in quadrant two. Okay, in quadrant two and three, you must add. 180. Otherwise, you just don't get the right answer. Okay. In quadrant one, you don't add anything. In quadrant four, I mentioned this earlier in the course, but it bears repeating. In quadrant four, you can add 360. Okay. But you don't have to. It's kind of optional. And if you don't, what you wind up is getting a negative angle. And you say, well, how do I interpret a negative angle? The negative number means that you measure clockwise rather than counterclockwise. So a positive angle is measured clock counterclockwise from the plus x axis. A negative angle would be measured clockwise from the plus x axis. Okay, so um, uh, I just mentioned it here. I mean, I think it came up a little bit earlier in the course too, but uh, you know, like uh, when I first introduced that, I said you always add 360, but really technically in quadrant four, it's optional. Because if you don't add the 360, you wind up with a negative angle. And if you interpret the negative as measuring clockwise, you still wind up at the same place. OK, so OK, so we have, you know, the Y component here and the X component and divide the two. Make sure you have the sign in there and divide the two. Take the inverse tangent, add 180 and you get 113 degrees. OK, so what's that 113 degrees mean? It means, you know, start here at the positive X axis. OK, and then you start turning counterclockwise, start turning counterclockwise, counterclockwise, counterclockwise until you get to the vector. And by the time you've turned to the vector, you've turned 113 degrees. OK, so there we go. That's the direction. Let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, nope. All right. Let me continue. And then the last question here was how much energy is released during the explosion? And is the explosion elastic? super elastic or inelastic okay so um you know uh energy is conserved but you know if you don't know about heat then you don't know when energy gets converted into heat and you go oh energy's disappeared okay or if you don't know about chemical energy like an explosion which is happening in this problem then you go oh look there was no energy before and then suddenly there is energy okay so um whenever you have a situation where the energy before and the energy after are equal then it's elastic whenever the energy after is greater than the energy before it's super elastic that's what happens in an explosion so you know that the answer is going to be super elastic but i'll show you how you can see that from the numbers okay and then when you have collisions where things stick together then the explosion is going to uh, convert energy into heat and so it looks like energy is disappearing and so those are inelastic collisions okay so again you know if things are sticking together inelastic if things are exploding super elastic and if the energy before and after are identical which is a rare but, but you know can't happen uh, those are elastic collisions okay so what's the energy before all right so the energy before ignoring that chemical energy that we don't know about uh, it's zero because the, the bomb that 20 kilogram chunk uh, is just sitting there at the origin, not moving, so it's got no energy before. The energy after is all kinetic, but it's got three contributions. It's got a contribution because the first mass is moving, and that contribution is going to be m one half mv squared, but calculated for mass number one, and then one half mv squared calculated for mass number two, and then one half mv squared calculated for mass number three, and then add them all up. Okay, so uh, uh, one half m one v one squared is the 
energy for the first one. And the numbers here for V1, you don't use the components or anything like that. It's just the magnitude. It does not matter what direction uh, M1 is moving in. Okay, And so you just put in 15. It doesn't matter whether it's in the X direction, Y direction, or even at some angle. It doesn't matter. Okay, And then 1 half M2 V2 squared. Same thing. A half times 7. And it doesn't matter that that 25 is along the negative Y direction. It's just 25 squared. Okay, And then finally, the last one is 1 half M. Uh, one half m, uh, m is eight, uh, m three. Sorry, is eight, and then v three. We just found that. Okay, v three was the magnitude here. Again, that v three that that goes into the energy. It's the magnitude. It's not the x component. It's not the y component. It's the just how fast is it going, irrespective of the direction, and that's the magnitude. Okay, which we found to be twenty twenty three point eight. I actually um, use that number right here, so that to get more decimals, okay? And uh, working that all out, uh, that turned out to be 5,015 joules uh, or 5.02 kilojoules, okay? And, uh, you know, a kilojoule is not that much. Like, uh, I, I, I don't know food energy in kilojoules that well, but like a chocolate bar would be around 100 kilojoules of energy. And this is only 5 kilojoules, so this is uh, hardly an explosion at all. Nonetheless, the energy after is greater than the energy before. So when the energy after is greater than before, it's a super elastic collision. And again, that happens with uh, with explosions. Okay, let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, I'm not seeing anything. And uh, so, so there it is. There's our first question. That was a little bit easy because I didn't put any of those vectors at an angle to uh, at some uh, arbitrary angle to the axes. And so I, I'm going to just quickly redo that problem, but this time I'm going to change it so that the five kilogram mass, rather than traveling directly along the x-axis, is going to be traveling at 75 degrees to the x-axis, okay? Uh, the, the seven kilogram I'm still going to make along the minus y-axis, but the five kilogram is now traveling at 75 degrees to the plus x-axis. Let's take a look at a diagram there. Okay, so what does that diagram look like? Let me switch here. Here we go. That's what that diagram looks like. Okay. So, oh, ah, darn. It crashed. I have no idea why this pro. Sometimes this program, it's called Pinta, works just fine. And sometimes it crashes like crazy. So, give me a second to bring up that diagram again. And not only do I have to restart the program, but I got to aim my. Uh, my my streaming software added. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, I think this time it won't crash. Okay, so so uh, you know the, the seven kilogram you can see it right there is moving along the mi minus y axis at twenty five meters per second, same as before. The five kilogram, rather than moving along the x axis, the plus x axis, is moving at seventy five degrees to the plus x axis. Okay, uh, intuitively intuitively it might be a little harder for you to see that it's. You know, the 8 kilogram is still going to be going in the uh, uh, into quadrant 2, uh, but it will. You may you might have guessed maybe it's going to go into quadrant 3, but no, it'll go into quadrant 2. Okay, as we'll see. All right. Like, uh, you know, uh, use your intuition when you can, but don't depend on it because sometimes you the like, intuition is just kind of guessing. It's kind of like an educated guess. Okay. So that you know where the answer, like where, what kind of answer you're looking for. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, you know, the problems are so complicated or y your intuition just doesn't help. And, you know, there's nothing you can do at that point, uh, but to just solve the problem uh, formally. Okay. So, um, so there we go. So the, this five kilogram mass is now at that 75 degrees. Let's go back and solve the problem. All right. Asking the same questions again. Well, part A, nothing changed. I mean, it's still the remaining piece is still eight kilograms. But uh, what's the X component of the uh, remaining piece now, M3? Well, uh, this part up to here is the same. OK, uh, you know, the momentum before X component, of the momentum before is zero. Uh, so the X component of the momentum after is going to be zero. And it still, of course, has contributions from the X component of uh, M1, V1, and the X component of M2, V2, and the X component of M3, V3. Okay, But now, V1, X is different. Okay, Before it was 15, but now we're at 75 degrees to the X axis. And so we have to use, you know, um, uh, we have to convert from... Uh, polar to Cartesian, okay? And the way you do that is uh, V1x, so the x component of V1 is going to equal V1, 
which is 50 meters per second. You know, that's its magnitude. How fast is it going? 50 meters. Okay, 50 meters per second times the cosine of the angle that it makes with the plus x axis. Okay, so 15 cosine 75 degrees, and that gives that number right there. Okay, so this is the only thing that really changed from the previous problem. V2y, I'm sorry, V2x is still zero. All right, and that's because the seven kilogram is still traveling directly along the y axis. There's no x component. Okay, and so that's still zero. All right. And uh, V3x, well, we're solving for that. Okay, so uh, just repeating that down here, when we substitute in the numbers uh, for the x component of the momentum after, it's still zero because that's kind of the point. Momentum is conserved, so if it's zero before, it has to be zero after. Okay, uh, it's going to be five times the x component of V1, which we just found was that 3.88229 right there. Okay, and then M2 there is seven. V2x is a zero, okay, because the the seven kilogram is move, moving purely along y. There's no x component. Uh, M3 is eight, and V3x is what we're solving for, okay. And so uh, just jumping to the answer there because this is a pretty trivial uh, uh, formula to solve, and that turns out to be um, a negative two point four two six four three meters per second. And I should probably say I would round that off, of course, too. This. Okay, meters per second. All right, so there's your V3x, okay, and it is along the negative x axis as expected, okay. Uh, what about the y component? Uh, again, start off the same way as before. The y com the total, the, sorry, the y component of the total momentum before, zero. Nothing is moving, okay. 20 kilogram mass is sitting at rest. If you're sitting at rest, you know, there's a mass, 20 kilograms, but the velocity is zero. And remember, momentum is m times v. So v is zero, and the momentum is zero. Okay. After, it's the um, the momentum after is the contribution of the three pieces. All right, and only y component. And so v one y is the magnitude times sine of the angle. In other words, 15 sine of 75 degrees which gives you that number right there, 14.488889, okay? All right, the y component of V2, that's the seven kilogram, that's still negative 25 because it's traveling 25 meters per second along the negative x axis, okay? And we're solving for V3y, so that's still question mark. All right, so starting from that expression there for the momentum after the collision, it's still zero, M1 is five, V1y, we just calculated that, it's 14.48889, okay, like that. And then M2 is 7, V2y is negative 25, M3 is 8, and we're solving for that right there, okay. So again, this is easy to work out, and it turns out that V3y is 12.819442. And here I could just say uh, V3y is along the positive y axis. Okay, so again, this might have been a little harder to see because, you know, things are more of an angle, but uh, well, it does make intuitive sense if you think about it, you know, so, so this one is traveling up. So it has both a plus Y and a plus X component. This one is purely negative Y, but the negative Y is bigger than the plus Y from the, uh, from the five. So the five kilogram does contribute to plus Y, but the seven kilogram contributes even more to negative y, so that eight kilogram has to be has to have a component in the plus y uh, direction. Okay, so that's why your y component of the velocity for the eight kilogram is actually positive. All right. Um, so uh, okay, so there we go, um, and that gives us both the x and the y component. And the last two questions, or the next two questions, I say convert to polar. In other words, give me the magnitude. So v three is just the square root of the um, some of the squares of the other two components, and that turns out in this case to be 13 meters per second, okay? So before it was like, what, 23 point, uh, it was like um, 23.8. This time, it's actually um, only 13 meters per second, okay? And uh, uh, what's the direction now? And so the direction, again, inverse tangent of the y component divided by the x component, plus 180 because you're in quad two. 
Okay, so if you work that out, that turns out to be an angle of 100 degrees. All right. So this time, I'm just showing the diagram, you know, if you start on the plus x axis here and you start turning, 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 first you pass the first vector at 75, the plus y axis at 90, keep going, and at 100 degrees, that's the direction at which the 8 kilogram mass is moving, okay? It's different than the previous one because <clears throat> the 5 kilogram is heading in a different direction, okay? So, all right. Last question, how much energy is released and is it elastic, super elastic or inelastic? Well, we know right away it's super elastic because it's, it's an explosion, okay? And uh, the energy before is zero. Again, the 20 kilogram mass is just sitting there. The energy after, just add up one half mv squared for all the three pieces. So here's one half mv squared for the first piece, for the second piece and for the third piece, okay? And the, the magnitudes only, no, don't worry about direction, so that's 15, that V2 is 25. V3, you say, well, what is that? That's what we found right here, okay? So that was the magnitude of the velocity for the third piece was that 13.04705, okay, S squared, all right? And that turns out to be 3.43 kilojoules, okay? Uh, less than before because, you know, it's a different type of explosion, okay? And super elastic. All right, um, I hope I didn't go too fast. Uh, I didn't want to waste your time with uh, uh, going through a lot of uh, uh, trivial um, uh, arithmetic there. Uh, and uh, the second one was just a repeat of the first one. So uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast. But if I do, you know, um, I've said this before, like, you know, just tell me to slow down. And I'd be happy to slow down. So, uh, all right, if there are no questions with this one, let me move on to a rotational motion problem. Okay, I've got two of them. Okay, I've actually got three, but I'm going to skip one because we, we actually did uh, one like it. Okay, so uh, here's question number three. Uh, a rod of length uh, 1.2 meters and mass 3 kilograms is free to rotate around the center. Its center. Okay, whoops, got that up too high. There we go. Okay, so a rod of 1.2 uh, meters and mass 3 kilograms is free to rotate around its center. So I don't have a, a rod here, but, you know, if I take my remote here and, you know, I just, like, allow it to rotate through the middle, there we go. It's, like, free to rotate like that. That's the situation we have. I'll draw a picture uh, as we work through the problem, but uh, uh, that's what we have. So with a rod, you know, we consider two possibilities in the in the uh, pre-recorded lectures. You know, I talked about a rod rotating around the middle. The other one was a rod rotating around one of the endpoints, okay, like this. Okay, so a rod rotating around one of the endpoints. Okay, but this one is rotating through the middle, okay? Uh, it's initially at rest, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to apply 100 newton force 20 centimeters from the center at an angle of 45 degrees. So uh, this one might be a little hard to picture right now what to do, but, um, you know, I'll draw, I'll, I'll draw a picture for that one, okay, when we get there. Now, you know, like with a lot of my problems... Uh, you, you, you might, you know, if you, if you think about, like, you just read them, uh, you might anticipate where I'm going to go with, uh, with, with what kind of questions I'm going to uh, ask about these things, okay? I mean, I remember doing this when I was a student. I would kind of know what kind of questions the professor was going to ask because there's, like, not an infinity of all different possibilities, okay? And, uh, yeah, and, and you know, like, you don't want to throw something at the students where they're like, did we even study this in class, okay? So, so you know, if you look at this, you go, just well, what kind of a problem is this? And you can already see that this is going to be a tau is equal to I alpha problem. Okay, like uh, the, the angular equivalent of Newton's second law, because we're applying a force and we're going to get it rotating. Okay, so as soon as you apply a force, it that translates into a torque and then it's going to start rotating. Okay, but you now I'm, I'm walking you through it anyhow. So the first question I ask is, what's the moment of inertia? Okay, so the moment of inertia, I gave you quite a different, a few different ways of uh, calculating it. The first thing is, is, is it made up of point masses? Okay, if it's point masses, then for every mass, Every point mass, you just do mr squared. You just mr squared for the first one, plus mr squared for the second one, plus mr squared for the third one. Add them all up, and that's your moment of inertia. Okay. But then I also gave you a moment of inertia for some special shapes, like a rod, or a sphere, or a drum, or a disc. And actually, the drum and the disc are the same because if you take a drum and you squish it down, a drum, or sorry, disc is just a very thin drum. Okay, and the height of the drum doesn't really matter. So it's the same formula for a drum and a disc. Okay, so I gave you some formulas like that. And uh, those are particularly important for people that are going into like uh, PT or ESS because uh, sections of the human body can be modeled 
by you know little shapes okay like uh, like you know like the arm here it could be like a rod okay roughly speaking okay the forearm could be modeled as a rod rotating around one of the endpoints okay so um no that's why we uh, i gave you those um and there's quite a few of them uh, i just gave you a few to, to you know for the purposes of the course but there's actually a wiki page that lists them all off and there's quite a few of them all right so anyhow um digressed a little bit but you know i want the moment of inertia so what you do is you say well uh which one of the formulas do i want well this is a rod of uniform mass so i want the for rotating around the center so i want the formula i is equal to 1 12th ml squared okay so 1 12th ml squared so just plug in the numbers 1 12th uh the mass is three the length is 1.2, okay, uh, and you want to square that, and that gives you a moment of inertia of 0.36 kilogram meters squared, okay? So there's the moment of inertia of your rod, all right? And then the next question is, what is the torque due to the force, okay? So what is the torque due to the force that we're applying? Now for this one, um, you know, just before, just before jumping in and uh, uh, answering questions. Let, let me draw a picture so you have an understanding of what's going on here. Okay, so let me uh, create a uh, new whiteboard and let me actually, let me close this one because I'm afraid that if I don't close this one it's going to crash again. And one second here, let me close. Oh, okay, you know what? I didn't have to start another one. Let me close that one. Too many windows. Okay, there we go. Okay. Oh, it crashed. Jeez. I did all that so that it wouldn't crash, and of course it did crash. All right. When I started from fresh, it's okay. It's when it already has a diagram up, it decides to just crash. All right, there we go. I'm pretty sure this won't crash. So, I okay, let's start off. Uh, here's my bar, like that. And the bar rotates around the middle. So here is an axis of rotation like that. Okay, and it's going to be able to rotate. Let me do this in blue. It'll rotate like that, you know, around that uh, axis like that. Okay, the entire length of the bar is 1.2 meters. Okay, so half of the bar like this is going to be 0 0.6 meters like that okay but that's not even what's happening here let me just reread it uh, i'm going to apply a force 100 newton force 20 centimeters from the center so actually i'm going to be applying a force let me do the force in i don't know green here uh 20 centimeters so so 0 0.6 is like uh 0 0.6 is like 60 centimeters and so i'm just going to be applying it it doesn't matter which side i'm going to be applying it right there okay where this distance in there now that distance there, whoops, I didn't draw that too good. Okay, that distance in there, that is going to be 20 centimeters or 0.2 meters, okay? And how am I applying the force? I'm not applying the force perpendicular like that, okay? Uh, I'm actually applying the force at 45 degrees. And it might be a bit ambiguous because you might say 45 degrees this way or 45 degrees that way, and it actually doesn't matter. It's the same torque. So like that, where this angle in here, let me do it in red, that angle in there is 45 degrees, like that. And the force is 100 newtons. Okay. Now, um, you know, you would get the most torque if you pushed out here at 90 degrees. Okay. Uh, you know, like uh, picture a door. When you go to open a door, the doorknob is put as far from the hinges as possible. So the hinges are like here, okay? And you can't turn a door by pushing on the hinges. Rather, you want to push as far from the hinges as possible, like that. And you want to push perpendicular. Like you want to push at 90 degrees, like that, okay? So uh, here, uh, we're less than ideal because we're pushing at 20 centimeters rather than more, and we're pushing at 45 degrees rather than 90 degrees, okay? So it's less than ideal, okay? And so I ask, well, okay, we'll calculate that torque. And so here's the formula. The torque is equal to R of sine theta. Yeah, the, you know, a force gives rise to a torque, but the bigger R is, the more torque you get, and the closer the angle is to 90 degrees, 
the more torque you're going to get. Okay, and that R, you say, how do I measure that R? That R is all in all of these problems. R is always measured from the point of interest to the center to the axis. Okay, so where's the axis? Let me do it in blue here. Let me just circle it. There's the axis right there. Okay, and where's the point in question? Well, we're applying the force right there. And what's the distance between those two? 0.2 meters or 20 centimeters. Okay. So, all right. So how do I plug in here into my formula? For R, I'm going to put 0.2 meters. For F, I'm going to put 100 newtons because I said it's 100 newtons force and not 20 centimeters. And the angle is 45 degrees. And so that turns out to be 14.14214 newton meters. Okay. And why newton meters? Well, because I've got a newton there and a meter there. Okay. And so the units for torque are newton meters. By the way, just a bit of an aside, a newton meter is also a unit of work, which is a joule, okay? But uh, no one ever writes joules for torques. I mean, it, it looks kind of weird, okay? And the reason is, is that everyone thinks about uh, torques in terms of this formula, okay? It's R times F, okay? And then sine theta, of course, okay? But, you know, usually people apply a torque at 90 degrees because that's obviously when you're going to get the most torque is when you know, R and F are perpendicular to one another. Uh, but, you know, um, it, it, there, there still is an angle dependence. But, you know, the bigger R is, the more torque you get. The bigger F is, the more torque you get. Okay, that's why, like, you know, like a wrench, the longer the arm of a wrench, the easier it is to screw a bolt or unscrew a bolt. Okay, so you want to make R as big as possible because that gives you the biggest twisting action. Another way to think of torque is like a twisting or turning the ability to turn something. Okay, so anyhow, that answers this question. The torque due to this force is 14.1 newtons. Okay, if I were to, on a test, of course, I would round this off to 14.1 newton meters. All right, next, what is the acceleration? Or what is the angular acceleration? Okay, so what's the angular acceleration? Well, is there a relationship between tau i and alpha? And the answer is yes, it's tau is equal to i alpha. That's kind of the point of this question. And that is the rotational equivalent of f equals ma okay and uh, uh, what do you do well we want to solve for alpha because i am asking for the angular acceleration and so you know just rearranging this dividing both sides by i tau divided by i is that 14.1 divided by 0.36 which is 39.28372 and that works out to 30, rounds off to 39.3. And the units are radians per second squared, okay? And uh, you might look at this and you might go, okay, well, the units of I are kilogram meters squared and the units of tau are Newton meters. And where did this radians come from? Well, the truth of the matter is radians are dimensionless. They're not really a unit, okay? And that might seem confusing. You say, well, why even write it in there? Well, you're right, you don't have to, you could write per second squared like that and that would be perfectly legitimate uh, the reason most textbooks and, and I write in the radians there is just to remind you that we're talking about rotational motion here but really other than that it, it, there, there's uh, there's nothing very deep about that okay uh, so so what happens is that when you work out the units here like tau divided by I I won't do that now you actually won't get the radians you'll actually get that you'll actually just get per second squared but most people will write in the radians to remind you that this is angular acceleration okay so it's an angular quantity all right all right uh, next thing how long does it take the rod to spin up to a speed of 30 rpm so it starts at rest I said that up here or did I yeah I, I did initially at rest okay uh, it starts at rest and it spins up to a speed of 30 revolutions per minute how long does it take okay so uh, let's write down what we know we know that the initial angular velocity is zero radians per second okay uh, maybe I should just say something you know when we talk about speed you got to watch the the context so you know like in English we're um, we're kind of ambiguous sometimes or loose with the language. So, you know, when you say speed, you could be talking about how fast something is moving along a road. You could be talking also how fast something is spinning, okay, which is this case. I mean, you could even use speed for like how fast you download from the internet. So, you know, the word speed in English is kind of a loose word, all right? So you say, well, what do I mean? What does speed mean in this case? And it's the speed of something which is rotating and the speed of something which is rotating 
is the angular velocity. Okay, so that's the, the technical term, the angular velocity. How fast is this thing spinning? Well, initially, it's at rest, so it's not spinning at all. After some time, and that's what we're actually working out how long, okay, after some times, it's rotating at 30 revolutions per minute. RPM just stands for revolutions per minute, so there it is. Now, we can't solve, well, we shouldn't solve it in revolutions per minute. We should convert to MKS, and especially we need to convert to radians, and you'll see why radians are important here. Like you might have said, why did we work in degrees in this section? Why did we have to work in radians? And you'll see that in my next problem, okay? So you have 30 revolutions per minute, and uh, uh, we need to convert. So to convert the revolutions to radians, just remember that one revolution is 2 pi radians, okay? And so if you take uh, revolutions in the numerator and put revolutions here in the denominator, then you'll get radians in the numerator. And this piece of the fraction here, or this piece here, will get rid of revolutions and give you radians in its place. It's also per minute, and we want to convert from minutes to seconds. So minutes in the denominator here. So put min minutes in the numerator here. And one minute divided by 60 seconds is 1. Okay, so there's the conversion factor from minutes to seconds. You've seen this before, but it's worth repeating. And that gives you that value for the uh, uh, angular velocity once it's spun up to 30 RPM. That is 30 RPM uh, in radians per second. Okay, and we know that the angular velocity here is 39.28 blah, 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 blah from above. Okay, that's what we calculated here. And I'm asking for the time. Okay, so if you look through those three equations, you realize that it's actually equation number two that we want, that one right there. Omega is equal to alpha t plus omega naught. Okay, so just rearranging that, first I you know subtracted omega naught from both sides, then I divide by alpha from both sides. That isolates t, so t is going to equal omega minus omega naught divided by alpha. Plug in the numbers from above, and I find that it only takes... 0 0.08 seconds, so less than a tenth of a second. So this speeds up pretty fast, okay? That's probably because I used 100 here, 100 newtons, okay? Uh, fair size uh, force, sorry, fair size force for a smallish rod. Okay, anyhow, uh, so yeah, there you go. That's how long it takes for this thing to spin up to uh, 30 RPM, okay? All right, uh, three more questions here. What is the tangential velocity of either of the tips of the rod when it's spinning at 30 RPMs? So tangential velocity <coughs> is actually a linear quantity. Even though this thing is going in a circle, you know, I could still say how fast along, you know, uh, uh, linearly is this thing uh, turning, okay? And uh, let me draw a picture because I think that'll help here. Okay, so first we're talking about an end, a tip, okay? And it doesn't matter which tip you're talking about. <clears throat> Let me do this, I don't know, in purple here. If you've got the colors, use them, right? So right here. So we'll just take uh, a tip of the uh, one of the, the bars there. And I just want to know how fast is this point moving? Like, you know, like uh, in meters per second, linearly, in other words, okay? And that's called the tangential velocity, like that. And, um, uh, Tangential quantities are related to their angular equivalent by uh, formulas like this, okay? So Vt, the tangential velocity, is equal to r times omega, okay? So uh, what's that r? And remember, uh, r, you know, sometimes students confuse how to measure r, but r is always measured from the point in question or the, the point of interest, which um, uh, let me do it in right here, which is this point right here, okay? Actually, this point right here. Uh, that's orange, but that's okay. It'll work. All the way to the center. So you say, well, okay, how far is it from the point of interest to the center there like that? And we already determined that that was 0.6 meters, okay? So R is uh, 0.6, like that. And omega, well, that's the omega that we found above here like that. And r times omega will give you 1.88 meters per second. But um, back to like this formula here. This formula here, there's actually three of them, and they they all look like this: linear quantity. Uh, let's just say linear is equal to r times ang the angular quantity. Okay. So whatever the linear quantity is, whether it be the velocity or acceleration or even the length. 
okay? You just take the equivalent angular quantity, take the angular quantity, multiply it by r, and you get the linear quantity that corresponds to it. So omega is the angular quantity. It's how fast it's spinning in a circle. It's how fast it's rotating. You multiply that by r, and that gives you the tangential velocity. That is how fast is this thing moving in meters per second, okay, at that particular point at a distance r from the center, okay? So uh, that's where this formula comes from. And above, I said that, you know, we had to work in radians because the formulas wouldn't work. Well, you know, these formulas, like these three, the, the three that we usually uh, work with with kinematics, they would actually work no matter whether you're working in radians or degrees. It's this one right here that does not work unless you're working in radians, okay? So if you were to, say, do this and you had, like, instead of radians per second, you had degrees per second, this formula doesn't work. Or if you had rotations per second, this formula doesn't work. This formula only works when you have when your angular quantity is in radians, which is why in this section, unlike the rest of the course, we worked in radians. We worked in radians so that this formula here would work and, and its equivalent formulas, okay? So uh, what is the tangential velocity? Okay, we'll get the tangential velocity from the angular velocity by just multiplying by r, okay? So the next question is, what is the centripetal acceleration? Now, this one is a little bit different. This one is not, you don't get that one from alpha. This one is actually uh, um, you obtain from the omega, but it's instead of r omega, it's r omega squared. Okay, I'll draw a picture of it in a minute. It's actually not tangential; it's centripetal, meaning that it points towards the center. Okay, so this is not responsible for getting this thing rotating faster or slower. Okay, or I guess in this case, rotating faster. This one is all about keeping you know that point uh, at the tip on a circle. Okay, and so it is a center seeking acceleration and you calculate it as r omega squared. Actually, this uh, we had uh, with uniform circular motion. Okay, so um, r omega squared gives you the centripetal acceleration. So 0 0.6 times the angular velocity squared. And in this case, it turns out to be 5.92 meters per second squared, a little bit more than half the um, uh, acceleration due to gravity, right? Acceleration due to gravity, 9.8. Uh, and so this is a little bit more than that, all right? So a point on the tip of this uh, bar would feel a centripetal acceleration, uh, you know, towards the center of about half of its weight, which is, you know, significant, okay? <coughs> and uh, uh, next... What is the tangential acceleration? So the tangential acceleration is kind of the equivalent or the the uh, analogous acceleration to the tangential velocity. It's along the outside. I'll draw a picture showing you which direction these are in in just a minute, okay? So this one, you know, this is vt is equal to r omega. This one is at is equal to r alpha, okay? So this is the, like in that series that the linear quantity is equal to r times the angular quantity, okay? So r... 0.6, okay. Alpha, well, we calculated alpha above, 39.28372. Multiply them together, and you get a tangential acceleration of 23.57023, or again, rounding that off the way I would on a, on a test, it would be equal to this meters per second squared. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, uh, you know, let me draw what where those accelerations are because it's a little hard to see uh, you know what is an acceler uh, what is a centripetal acceleration what's a a um, tangential so let me redraw the bar here because that uh, that other picture is getting a little bit too busy right now here's the center okay and uh, we're looking at a point on the edge here okay so uh, it doesn't matter whether it's this edge or this edge okay or tip like that. There's two accelerations that that point is going to uh, experience. There's one acceleration towards the center, okay? And this is called AC, the centripetal acceleration. Petal, the, in centripetal, the petal part comes from the Latin word for seek. The Latin word for seek is petere. And so this is like seeking the center. It's like towards the center. And uh, this acceleration is just because this thing is on a circle. Okay, so you remember from uniform circular motion, you needed an acceleration whenever you're turning. And on a circle, it's like you're turning all the time. You're always turning towards the center, 
okay? And so you had the centripetal acceleration, the center-seeking acceleration. But when you have generalized rotational motion, you might not only be turning, but you might be speeding up as you turn or slowing down as you turn. In this case, you're speeding up. And so you have another acceleration, which is tangential like this, okay? And that's AT. <clears throat> so a point on the tip there would actually experience two accelerations, one or two components to an acceleration, one towards the center and one perpendicular like that. Okay. Now you might say, well, there are two accelerations. Would I feel the two separately? No. I mean, uh, you know, if you got one acceleration one way and another component the other way, they would add and you would say, well, how would they add? Well, they would add like vectors, right? And so, uh, yeah, there are two accelerations, but they would add like vectors. And so your resultant vector would be something like that. That would be like, that would be the acceleration that you experience. You'd experience, you know, not only being pulled towards the middle, but also being pushed along the edge. And so ultimately you'd be experiencing a vector somewhere like middle-ish, but also edge-ish. I don't know how else to put it, but there you go. It's somewhere along that direction. Okay, so uh, there you go. Those are the two accelerations that you have in... Uh, generalized rotational motion. All right, let me take a look in the chat if there's any uh, questions with that one. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I don't see any questions, so uh, let me do the last one, okay? Well, I was going to do this one here. Uh, let me just mention it. It's a ball of uniform mass, three and a half kilograms, five centimeters, rolls downhill and drops a vertical distance of uh, 25 centimeters. That is not how you spell vertical, okay? Uh, but you know what? Um, it, it turns out, I mean, when I wrote the question, I wasn't thinking. Sorry, I'm going to scroll that down a bit. I, you know, I wasn't thinking. We did, actually did one like that. Uh, that was the week before uh, before the Thanksgiving break. So I don't see a point to, uh, uh, to redoing that. Um, uh, you could just go back and watch that live stream again. Uh, you know, that's, that's the reason I chose live streams over Zoom is so that you could, you know, watch them over and over and over again. But there you go. Okay, and then I also had like a repeat, but that's okay. Let's do this last one because this last one is a little bit more uh, conceptually demanding. Okay, and uh, it's a it's a conservation of angular momentum problem. Okay, and then I think we're done. Uh, a, a disc has mass of one kilogram and radius fifty centimeters. Okay, and it's free to rotate around the middle. So you can imagine a disc, and it's got like an axis there, and this thing can rotate around the middle, and it's initially at rest. Okay. And uh, there's a little bullet, a five gram bullet, and plus a little bit of an explosive on the edge of this thing. I'll draw a picture to help you think about it a little bit better. So there's this bullet and a little bit of explosives behind the bullet on the edge. When the explosives go off, the bullet is going to go flying off tangentially to the edge. Okay? Well, as you can imagine, if the bullet goes one way, the disc is going to recoil and start turning in the opposite direction. Okay? I want to know how fast is it turning in the opposite direction. All right. And so uh, uh, let me finish reading it and then I'll draw a picture. Uh, it has a little bullet plus explosive on the edge. When the explosive goes off, the bullet flies off at 500 meters per second in a direction tangential to the edge of the disc. Okay. And I'll draw tangential in a minute, though I think you know what that is already. How fast is the disc spinning after the bullet is fired? Okay, so it's not spinning before and then it's spinning afterwards. Okay, so let's switch to the whiteboard and it disappeared on me. So hold on. There we go. It's strange. Sometimes when it just starts to act up, it, uh, I don't know, like sometimes it just works. Sometimes it does not work. Let me close this and hopefully... Hopefully this is not going to crash on me now. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, so what? what's the situation? So we have this disc. I'm looking down on the disc like this. There's the disc. And here's the middle of the disc like that. Okay. And on the edge, there's this bullet. So here's the bullet. And you might imagine that, like, what's bracing the bullet is maybe a little tab here like this, okay? So I know I didn't mention this in the problem, but just, like, imagine this little tab like this and this tab is well I don't know. there we go that tab is actually attached to the uh, to the disc okay and then between the tab and the bullet there like this there's a little bit of explosive okay and uh, there's the before picture nothing is moving right now okay the explosive goes off and you know what's going to happen the bullet is going to head off this way like that 
okay? And that's tangential, okay? So like uh, like if the bullet head out went, went off like that, in that direction, that's not tangential. Uh, that would be perpendicular, okay, to the disc, okay? And, uh, or if it, even if it went like that, uh, you know, that's not tangential. But, you know, going straight along the edge like that, that's called tangential, okay? So there's the bullet, and it's, of course, going at five, whoops, let me do this in blue. Okay, that's going at 500 meters per second here like that. Well, what do you think the the um, the disc is going to do? So the disc, uh, I know there's the explosives there, but the disc is kind of bracing the bullet. It's kind of they, when the explosives go go off, the explosives are not only going to push the the bullet forward, but they got to push the the disc back. And so the disc is going to start rotating that way. And I want to know how fast is it rotating? What's that angular velocity? of this thing rotating in the opposite direction, okay? And you say, geez, how in the world would I do this problem? Like, like, how do I approach it? And it's basically a conservation of angular momentum problem, okay? So it's kind of like um, uh, the very last problem that I did in the um, uh, pre-recorded lecture where I had a bullet hitting a rod. The bullet rod is initially standing still. The bullet hits it and it gets embedded and it makes the rod spin. This is the opposite of that. Instead of the bullet hitting the rod and embedding in this case the bullet is flying off from the disc and causing it to spin okay so you know it's just a variation of uh, uh the same kind of a theme okay but it's it is conceptually demanding so let's let's go through it okay so uh first of all it is a conservation of uh, angular momentum problem so i just wrote that and you know like writing l is equal to l prime doesn't is not very um uh, illuminating this is basically you know the if you calculate the angular momentum before the explosion, you calculate the angular momentum after the explosion, they're the same. So this is basically the conservation of angular momentum. Okay, That's part of it, but there's also kind of a gluing together of linear momentum and angular momentum. And the reason you have to glue the two together is because when you, when you see that bullet going off at 500 meters per second right here, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing angular about this, right? You know, like, like that's a pretty straight line. Okay, so that's not angular momentum there. And you go, well, how do I glue the linear momentum of the uh, bullet to the angular momentum of the, whoops, the angular momentum of the disc, okay? And so that's another kind of interesting aspect to this problem, okay? So, um, all right, I'm going to use a conservation of angular momentum. What's the angular momentum before, okay? And by the way, the units of angular momentum, I have them down here. Uh, where do I have them? Might as well put them in there per second. Okay, They're not that interesting, but, you know, just for completeness, uh, the units for angular momentum are kilogram meters squared per second. Okay, so uh, well, what's the angular momentum before? Well, nothing is moving. And so there's no contribution of the angular momentum from either the bullet or the disc. And so the total angular momentum before is zero. Okay. What's the angular momentum after? Well, we know it's going to equal zero, but what contributes to it after? Well, the bullet's going to contribute to the angular momentum and the disc is going to contribute to the angular momentum. Okay. So we have to calculate both of them. All right. Now, um, I don't know why I did the disc first, but I did. Okay. So uh, let, me, let me just separate these out a little bit like that okay so we got to look at both of these we got to look at the angular momentum of the bullet and the angular momentum of the disc okay and when we add them together that's the total angular momentum which we know must equal zero because it's conserved okay now the next thing is so, so we're looking at the angular momentum of the disc you say well how do i calculate angular momentum and the general formula is actually let me write it over here um, the general formula is l is equal to i times omega and you can compare that to, I'm going to put a little space in it, compare to P is equal to, oops, capital P is equal to MV, right? So what's this? This is linear momentum. So if you take the mass, you multiply by the velocity, you get the linear momentum. The angular equivalent of that is you take the moment of inertia, which is like the mass, and you multiply it by the angular velocity, which is like the linear velocity, and you get the angular momentum, okay? So we need to add up I omega for all the pieces afterwards, and that's got to equal zero. All right, 
So what's the angular momentum of the disk? Well, the angular momentum of the disk is the moment of inertia of the disk multiplied by the angular velocity of the disk after. Okay, so I didn't put the little ticks here everywhere because I don't know, it would get kind of ugly. But uh, this is this is all being calculated after the explosion. Okay, so you say, okay, great. Um, let's calculate each of these pieces um, uh, on their own. Well, the angular velocity of the disk, there's nothing to calculate because that's what we're solving for. Okay, because I said, how fast are we spinning after the bullet is fired? Okay, so that's the angular, how fast is the disk spinning? Okay, so that's omega disk. All right, so we're not we're not going to calculate that. I mean, sorry, we're not going to we don't find a number to substitute in. We're going to calculate that. Okay, uh, so can we calculate this though? The the moment of inertia of the disk. Yeah, so it's a disk of uniform mass, so it's like one half m r squared. Okay, so one half m. I said uh, what did I say it was one kilogram. Yep, it's one kilogram. So we put in a one here for the mass. And the radius of this thing is half a meter, 0 0.5 centimeter, sorry, 0 0.5 meters or 50 centimeters. And that turns out to be 0.125 kilogram meter squared. That's the moment of inertia of the disk. Okay. So we don't have the total angular momentum of the disk because we don't know omega, but we're solving for that. Great. That was one of these. Okay. That was this piece right here. Okay. Angular momentum of the disk. What about the angular momentum of the bullet? That one's a little bit more conceptually demanding. Because the bullet goes off in a straight line, but you could still think of it the same way. The moment of an, uh, the the angular momentum of the bullet is the moment of inertia of the bullet multiplied by the angular velocity of the bullet. And at this point, you're like totally blown away because you're going, well, how can it have? If it's going in a straight line, if it's linear, how does it have a moment of inertia? And how does it have an angular velocity? So let me go back to the diagram here and let me show you how you can get both of those. OK, uh, it's easier to see it right now in the diagram. So, um, you know, you could consider the bullet at any point here, like, you know, there, 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 like at any one of those points, you can calculate the angular momentum of the bullet. But it's kind of hard to do it at any at every one of those points. The, the easiest place to do it is right there just a, like an instant after the the explosion explosives have gone off okay so that's why we're going to concentrate on this point right here not because l is different there than it is over there okay l is the same all the way along the path it's just that it's computationally easiest to calculate it right there okay all right so let's go through it l whoops l is going to equal i times omega and again this is for the bullet so I for the bullet is what? What? How do you calculate that? Well, it's a mass and it's at a radius R, isn't it? Let's do it in red here. See, there's a radius R there like that. Uh, I didn't draw this so, so good, but anyhow, there's your radius R and there's a certain mass M. And so all you do is you just treat the bullet like a, like a, uh, a point mass. And what's the moment of inertia of a point mass? M r squared okay and uh, i won't substitute the numbers in here i'll do that on the other whiteboard but that's the formula we're going to use for the moment of inertia of the the mass okay and then you say okay well what about the angular velocity of the bullet like it's going in a straight line so you say well how how in the world can you relate the velocity which is a linear quantity to omega which is a angular quantity well listen to what I just said, how are you going to relate a linear quantity? And in fact, it's a tangential velocity because the bullet goes off tangentially. How are you going to relate that to an angular quantity? And it's R like that. So the angular and linear quantities are related by that formula, which we just used a minute ago. OK, and so over here, now just rearranging this, just rearranging that formula there. Uh, you can say, okay, well, it's whatever the velocity is of the bullet traveling. It's tangential like that, divided by r. Okay, and so you could see that in both cases, I'm sort of converting the linear quantity into its angular equivalent, and convert the linear quantity into its angular equivalent, and then I have that, and I can calculate that. Okay, for the bullet. All right. So let me switch back to the other whiteboard over here. And so I can say, okay, the angular momentum of the bullet, it's still I times omega. And you say, well, how do I get the angular 
Uh, how do I get the moment of inertia of the bullet? Well, it's a point mass. So the moment of inertia of the bullet, I for the bullet, is just mr squared. It's a point mass. Okay. What's m? Well, m is the, the mass of the, the bullet, 5 grams. Okay, converting that to kilograms, 0 0.005 kilograms. Okay. And what about R? Well, R, it's at the edge of the disc. The disc has a radius of 0.5 meters, and so there's 0.5. And putting that all together, you find that the moment of inertia of the bullet is 0 0.00125 kilogram meters squared. Okay. And then you go, okay, well, what about the angular velocity of the bullet? And you say, okay, well, just get that from the linear by dividing by r, okay? So you take the linear velocity, divide by r, so 500 meters per second, because I said, how fast does it travel when it flies off, when it's fired off, 500 meters per second, okay? 500 meters per second at a radius of half a meter, 0.5 meters, and that gives you a an angular velocity of 1,000 radians per second, okay? So, you know, this idea of like converting between Linear, the linear and the uh, their angular equivalent, you could do that, and that's how you glue together linear and angular quantities, okay? So it could get pretty crazy, but I'm not going to give you anything more uh, demanding than something like this, okay? So cause I think this is demanding enough, okay? Okay, great. So we got the moment of inertia. We've got the angular velocity. Put them together, I times omega, I times omega here, and it turns out that the angular uh, momentum of the bullet is going to be 1.25 kilogram meters squared per second. Okay? And so, uh, why did we do this? Well, if we go back to this one, this was the total angular momentum of the bullet plus disc after the explosion. Do we have the angular momentum of the bullet after the explosion? Yes. 1.25. Okay? Do we have the, um, uh, the total angular momentum after? Yes, it's zero. Because it was zero before, it's got to be zero after. It's conserved. Okay. Uh, what about the angular moment of the disc? Well, not all of it. We have the moment of inertia of the disc, and that turned out to be right here. Moment of inertia of the disc was 0.125. So the moment of inertia of the disc was 0.125. And the angular velocity of the disc, that's what we're solving for. Okay. And so now, you know, it's just a matter of like solving, and you wind up getting that the angular velocity of the disc after the explosion is negative 10 radians per second okay and so yeah you know your your intuition kind of fits you know you expect that uh go back to the the picture here you expect that when the bullet goes off you know when the bullet goes off i'm running out of colors here when the bullet goes off this way okay this thing is gonna respond by turning that way okay and it recoils in other words it recoils okay and so there you go there's a uh, uh, an angular momentum problem, conservation of angular momentum problem, gluing together the linear momentum and the uh, angular momentum. Okay, well, that uh, that's it for the uh, class. Let me uh, see if there's any questions here. Uh, this this uh, uh, YouTube interface is, is crazy. Like, there's two places where it says concurrent viewers. One place it says three concurrent viewers. Another place says four. I don't know how many people are watching this right now, but uh, uh, anyhow... Uh, you know, uh, there's more people in the class. Obviously, they can watch it later. But um, so uh, let me just ask in the chat here: uh, Is everyone okay? Uh, can we end the stream? Are we done, guys? All right. Okay. Great. All right. Bye-bye. Not seeing any other questions. Bye-bye.